Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Wildlife for You podcast. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since our last podcast where we talked to some students that we took on a, on a wonderful Western trip. And so Meg and I have been talking over the last week or so trying to figure out what we're going to talk about today. And we decided that for today's podcast, we wanted to tackle pretty much a hot topic. Bears, Meg, I don't know if you've noticed this, but bears <laughs> have been in the news quite a bit lately. There, there's been lots of different stories, yep. but I'm, I'm going to call up a, a couple of them and hopefully talk about them because obviously I love bears, you love bears. Um, and so what I'd love to do is just spend some time talking about some issues regarding bears that have come up lately in the news. So... Um, before we get started, I, I should have let off with this, but I'm your host. I, I'm <laughs> Daryl Radijek, a uh, longtime wildlife biologist, been running this Wildlife View platform for a number of years, and I have my co-host with me who's coming in from Tennessee. Why don't you introduce yourself, Meg? I'm Meg Pelly. Um, I have zero credentials to talk to you about <laughs> Except what? that I love wildlife and I ask all those questions that everybody really wants to know. Yes, and that, that's why you're <laughs> such a perfect match because you have the passion um, and the questions that many, many people have. And so hopefully, put it this way, if I can't answer any of your questions, I can tell you where to find the answers. That's it. That's um, it. <laughs> and I'm not shy about telling you I don't know, but if we're going to talk about bears today, I feel pretty comfortable in our topic since I've been dealing with them and working with them for many, many years. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so a story that came across my desk about a week or so ago, and I, I sent it to you, yeah. um, it was a story about a bear out of Lake Tahoe. And the funny thing is, Lake Tahoe, folks, if you don't, if anyone out there doesn't know, is located in the western half of California, right near the California-Nevada line. But Sierra Nevada's beautiful, beautiful mountain country. So they, Lake Tahoe, I, I would, I guess I would compare it to your neck of the woods with Gatlinburg. Yeah. With it being a really touristy area. But the, the main thing that the two have in common is prime, prime bear country. Yep. And so a lot of Folks have residential or second homes up in the mountains around Lake Tahoe, and they deal with bears all the time. And they're usually pretty good. Well, most people in those areas are pretty good, but it only takes a few bad apples. Mm. Um, but anyway, there has been a bear that more or less gained notoriety over a number of years. Is a really, really big bear. And it gained notoriety because it kept visiting houses and it was, it was doing some not so good things. And, uh, they nicknamed it. I love this Hank the tank, but <laughs> Meg, tell the part of the story that we just learned after they captured the bear. <laughs> uh, well, Hank the tank is a, a she and not a he. Uh, and so, so they chose a few other names, which I thought were quite interesting. Uh, Meg the keg. Um, I like that. And what, no, what was the other one? That, Marge. Uh, yeah, Marge, Marge the Barge. <laughs> so whether or not we call it Marge the Barge or Meg the Keg, um, <laughs> we'll stick with Marge for now. Okay, there we go. But, well, anyway, Marge <laughs> has been, Misbehaving. I want to say terrorizing um, like the Lake Tahoe area because it's very popular bear, charismatic bear. Everyone knows it and loves it. But it has been getting into, breaking into places, cabins, sheds, um, different facilities, trying to secure man-made foods. And we know that's not good. And the people in Tahoe, in fact, I, I believe they've formed a coalition called the Bear League that really watches over the bears. I I have some issues with what they do. <laughs> um, but... Literally, what finally came to fruition is the, the bear got into too much trouble, and the wildlife agency out there ended up capturing the bear because it had broken into a house, and this very, very large black bear 
which was a female, had a couple of cubs. And they had to make the unfortunate decision of they, they couldn't just release that bear. It, it was becoming a public menace, like truly a danger to the public because, heck, you have a three, 400, 500. I don't know how big she was. Do, do you recall? Did they mention how big she was? I, I don't. I don't think they said. From, from pictures, mean, she was huge. Yeah, I, yeah, the picture um, was. And, and when you have a black bear of that size, it truly is a danger to society if they're breaking into people's homes. Mm -hmm. And so they finally had to do something, and unfortunately, they had to separate her from her cubs, which should be large enough to fend for themselves. Um, but they they made the decision not to euthanize her but they were sending her to a sanctuary, I believe in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you feel, Meg, but some people think that's a victory. Mm -hmm. I do not. Taking a bear out of the wild, I know the options with euthanasia, relocation, a lot of those are very unpopular, but I consider putting a, a wild animal in a sanctuary or a zoo setting is is equally unpopular just mm -hmm. it's got to be a horrific thing for that bear who spent its entire life roaming free and now it will no longer have that so that was a lose lose situation for the people in the bear there mm -hmm. um, but the the one thing to to remember with this situation th this didn't happen overnight it's not like marge finally smelled something good and decided to get into a house. This has been a pattern of bad behavior and whose bad behavior do you think it is? <laughs> that's ours. <laughs> that, that, that's on people. Exactly. And bears. Yeah. And I, I will say for the most part, I, I can almost guarantee that the vast majority of situations where that bear was gaining access to human foods, it was not because people were doing it intentionally. Uh, there are lots of people that want to do good things by bears, but they just don't think things through. So, for example, putting your garbage out the night before or, or, or storing your, your trash in, in a location where bears have as easy access to it. You're not intentionally feeding the bears, but you're feeding the bears. And you are just as much a part of the problem which results in that bear, unfortunately, having to be captured and, and moved um, as anyone else. And so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today, because you know as well as I, this isn't just the, a problem that occurs in Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, you know, we, we see this, that in the area that I'm in, in East Tennessee, uh, with the bear population around... Um, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, even, and you know, we've you and I've talked about this. There, there are many rental cabins that surround the national park, um, and I can't tell you how many times I talk to tourists and they tell me, "Well, there was a bear on my deck last night," or um, "We have a bear-proof can, but the bear it wasn't locked, you know, what it wasn't secured properly, and and the bear just got in it and." strode garbage up and down the driveway and um you know and and i always try to take the opportunity to explain to them um you can be part of the solution in helping these bears um not behave in a, in a poor manner uh, you know simply not allowing them to approach you and you know and that's one thing that we teach bear safety is you don't ever allow a bear to approach you even if it's and not necessarily an aggressive bear, but if you're in its path of normal travel and it's moving towards you, you still cannot allow the bear to approach you. You don't want that human interaction and you're going to have to, to, to do something to make the bear go a different direction from the, where you are. And that's the same thing when you're not on a trail, but you're out at a rental cabin, you know, and so many people want to see a bear and I completely understand that, but it's much better to see it in its natural habitat than on the deck of your cabin. Um, you know, and maybe you weren't the one that left the things out there, but as you were saying, this is a process. This, this is a training process that goes on 
for a long period of time that we're teaching these bears that, hey, there's a food source here and it's easy. And they I'm come gonna, to I'm going to go back to something you said, because I, I absolutely love what you said, because I struggle sometimes because I don't like telling people they're the problem when they don't realize they're the problem. Um, because people do things not realizing the consequences of their actions. And so they, they, they don't feel like they're part of the problem and they don't understand when I, when I refer to them as being part of the problem. But you said it so much more eloquently is that people can finally take charge and be part of the solution. And so to get rid of all the negative limelight that I sometimes cast when I get frustrated, but if we want bears to live a long, healthy, happy life, the folks that love the bears can do so, so much more, mm -hmm. especially when you encounter the situation you described. If you're at a rental cabin somewhere in bear country and you see a bear kind of approaching, being very inquisitive, what, what do you think most people do? They get their phones out and start taking pictures. That's exactly it. They, they get their camera, think how cool it is. And don't get me wrong. It is really cool to see a bear. But they allow that bear to come up and sniff around, look for food scraps, maybe maybe bird seed, whatever is drawing that bear to the cabin. And all the people are intent on doing is capturing a photo and sharing it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote an article. Oh, it's been a number of years now, it, but it's uh, it was a bear story I will not share. And it's it's literally all about those Facebook posts that show a bear in a garbage can or a bear up on a deck or a bear in a hot tub. Those photos drive me nuts because if you look at those on social media, they'll have like millions of views and thumbs up and smiles. And it's, how cool is that? And that is so uncool because they're literally taking a picture of a bear leading to its death sentence and they don't realize it. And so I really appreciate you saying be part of the solution because my message for so long is, has been stop being part of the problem. And so it's, it's probably a much kinder way to, <laughs> to teach people is you can save a bear. You can help that bear live a long, health, happy, healthier life. If you become part of that solution by not allowing that bear to wander around in the garbage can or sniff around by the grill. Um, and it doesn't take, we don't want anyone to do anything crazy of going out and approaching the bear, but all of us, you, you could grab pots and pans. You could yell at the bear. If you have a, your car keys have the, the car alarm on it, you could set that off. Bears when they're first developing these bad habits are really timid. If you've ever seen a bear, the first time it's it's scared to death. You you could yell boo at the bear and it's going to run up. <laughs> the yeah. And so if we had the vast majority of people, instead of staying on their phones, I don't mind if people take a picture, but if they sit there and take video, 10 minute video, do that bear a favor and try to scare that bear away. Mm -hmm. Cause that's, that's really what's causing a lot of the issues around, yeah. around bear country. Yeah. And, and, you know, that occurs in all national parks where in, in what we call bear country. Um, 100%. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not a park in the East or the West. It's a park right. in North America. And, and we also see a lot of uh, tourists within the park, well-meaning, um, you know, they want to see a bear and they, maybe they see a bear across the road. Um, and instead of maybe slowing down and watching that bear as it crosses the road, they they get out of their car. They want to pursue that bear with their cameras or their um, cell phones. And not even, I mean, we're, we're talking specifically about bears because that's what's been in the news lately. But I've seen that with deer. Um, I actually watched a photographer one morning right at daybreak uh, get into a field with some big bucks and trying to get their picture and they kept moving and he kept getting closer and closer and closer. And so I was on the road, he was in the field and um, finally I made enough <laughs> noise that they moved 
and they jumped the fence in front of me into the road and then jumped the other fence into the other field. And so I got the better picture. <laughs> Uh, and I was not trying, but it, it was frustrating to see this person pursue the wildlife. I mean, it's one thing to stand back and watch them do their thing with your telescopic lens and take pictures where you're not close enough that they change their behavior. But when you start moving in to the point that you're so close, they're changing their behavior because of you. I feel like we've crossed a line. I I'm going to tattle on myself because I wrote another story besides the one about the bear story I will not share. Um, and this one, this one literally garnered hundreds of thousands of views. And it was probably because of the title, because obviously you got to have a, a slam dunk title. And I titled it, I killed a bear. And it's it's got the shock value. And what that story is about is not about bear hunting or or hitting it with a vehicle it's more or less about photography um, mm. and pursuing these bears. And, and this, this extends, you hit the nail on the head. It extends far beyond just bears, just wildlife in general. But when you, when you pursue an animal with so much vigor that you know exactly where it is at all times of the day, where it hibernates, where, where this animal raises its young, if you're following it that closely, you are impacting that animal. And the reason, the reason I wrote that article, and um, there there was a situation many many years ago where a bear ended up getting killed, and they found out it, it was it was literally like late late winter. It was almost springtime, and they found a bear that had a fractured skull in in the woods. And people, bears don't fracture their skulls in the woods. And so there was there was a lot of speculation about what happened, and someone someone brought up the notion that someone went out there and beat the bear with a club, which it, it just seemed absurd. And um, just talking to a number of uh, folks from that area, they informed me that there's there was plenty of photographers that knew that followed the bear all over the place, and the best explanation we had is that people just wanting to do really cool things, get pictures of bears probably woke that bear up from her sleep dur during the hibernation, scared her a little bit. She climbed up a tree and because they're still really groggy um, from sleeping, she more than likely fell out of the tree and then um, hit her head on a rock. That was the only explanation um, that, that really, really made sense. And it infuriated me because people don't realize they think they're doing good by these animals and getting wonderful pictures. Yeah, it will benefit their their pocket a little bit, but it often benefits the public by exposing more and more people to these wonderful animals out there. But man, when you are impacting an animal's life so much that you know every bit about that animal, you're following mm -hmm. it way too closely. Mm -hmm. So even and, with the best intentions, we, we often do wrong by these animals. Mm -hmm. uh, I an, an incident happened, and fortunately, the bear was not hurt, but it was very close. Uh, I was, a, as we know, I live close to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I was coming, I was outside of the park, just on the, on the road that goes around the edge of the park, um, and coming out of Gatlinburg, um, Lots of traffic on a normal day. On this particular day, there were cars lined up on both sides of the road. People were out of their car. And they were all standing on the left-hand side of the road. And I, I was traveling on the right-hand side of the road. And cars were parked all along that left-hand side of the road. And people were standing up on the bank. And they were looking up into the woods. Obviously, I knew they're looking a bear's out, you know because that happens quite frequently and, and people were looking and trying to take pictures. And as I'm driving along and I'm not going very fast, maybe 30 miles an hour. Um, as these people were looking for this bear, they'd lost it. What they didn't know is the bear had traveled through the woods and come down and it ran out in front of me from between two parked cars and I, I, I couldn't see it. And 
I don't know how I did not hit that bear. Yeah. I, I was in a Jeep and I, I slammed on my brakes and it, it got to the other side of the road. It scared me. I, I was shaking and I pulled over and looked at the front of my bumper to see if there was any hair in it <laughs> because I thought I had to have brushed it. And the people on the side of the road never saw it. They never saw that happen. But they had forced that bear to run out in traffic and with all their cars parked along the side of the road. So, and they were getting out. He ran, you know, there was no seeing him coming. He ran between two parked cars right in front of me. Um, you know, and they had changed, they had caused that bear to change his behavior. Oh yeah. yeah that, that's when you, you, you know, you're too close is when that, that's pretty much how we define uh, an encounter is when mm-hmm. you affect that animal's behavior. And I, I guarantee everyone listening to this podcast can recite a story of whenever, like whether or not it's Great Smoky Mountain National Park, Yellowstone, Yosemite, and any any park that has these large charismatic megafauna, everyone knows that when there's a bear or a moose or an elk nearby the road, people lose their minds. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so in that regard, I do want to say, <laughs> don't be part of the problem um, because yeah, we, we don't realize the impact we can have on these animals. And I promise you, everyone listening to this, nobody wants to be the reason why an animal gets hurt or mm-hmm. uh, regretfully killed. And so mm-hmm. anyway, the, that leads me, hey, actually, I'll, I'll bring up another story that recently came up because like we mentioned before, it's it, it's not just one instance that really puts a bear over the top. It's the culmination of so many people doing the wrong thing. And recently there, there is a national park that um, they had to close down a road because someone driving on a road uh, was approached in, in their vehicle was approached by by a bear in the road and it ended up um, injuring the person. I don't know if it was a scratch or a bite. Do you recall, Meg? Uh, I, I I'm not was- sure. I, I, I had saw that too. And I think maybe it was a scratch. I, I don't yeah. know for sure. And, and so, so literally I, the, the park was absolutely wonderful. They did the right thing. They closed that road down to hopefully allow that bear to move off, find other food sources, because mm-hmm. obviously it was, it was looking for handouts. Mm-hmm. The thing, the, the direction I want to take this conversation is not about that individual bear, or the reaction of the park or anything, but the reaction of the people when that story was, was published. So obviously social media is a beast. It, it's one of my, one of the greatest things and one of the worst things all in, in one thing. <laughs> Yeah, And so sadly, it seems to be more of the worst things than anything. And so as soon as the story goes that someone, someone was injured by a bear and they closed the road down, the vast majority of people were suddenly attacking that. Per- oh, that person was stupid. And they're, they're playing the blame game. And it mm-hmm. drives me nuts because I promise you, Meg, that person was not the only person that got too close to that bear. And there right. was probably dozens and dozens of others that led that bear to have those behaviors of mm-hmm. approaching a vehicle. And so mm-hmm. what people need to understand is when it comes to protecting the bears or protecting wildlife in general, this isn't always, it, you should not look towards the other person first you have to look in the mirror first because there's a lot of things that we do, whether intentionally or, but mostly unintentionally that is really having a negative impact on wildlife. And you mm-hmm. mentioned how many people would think, Oh, I'm, I'm staying in a cabin up in Wyoming or Tennessee or whatever. And a bear walks up on the porch. I promise you 99% of the people listening or just in the general public are going to grab their phone and just take a video. Yeah. But why don't we start being, like you said, part of the solution and start protecting these animals? Yes. And, and, you know, one of the things that um, I talk to visitors about is 
the the ways that the park tries to take care of animals or or the bears, but also the ways that they can help. And um, you know, we mentioned a little bit of scaring them away. You know, we specifically said the cabin when they try to come up onto your deck and and around your rental cabins because that's they do and that's a very popular thing as you said but um you know also um keeping your putting your garbage in the bear proof cans uh the correct way (laughs) using the it's it doesn't do any good if you have a bear proof garbage can and you don't use it the right way (laughs) um and you know even little things like locking your car door um because bears are very intelligent and you know we've had this conversation they will open your car door Yep. Um, you know, and I always tell people, don't, if you're having a picnic, don't, don't spread all your things out on your table, make a sandwich and then walk over to the Creek and leave everything out for the next hour or so, you know, it's, just, it's, it's little things that make big impacts on keeping. I guarantee, I, I guarantee every national park everywhere across North America, especially the, those parks that are in prime bear country. You go to any picnic area, and within a few minutes, you will find a cooler laying out. And it might be closer, but there will be free access to food. And and again, I I, I feel really bad saying that people are a problem, but it's, it's simply because they don't realize, like I said, the consequences of their actions. Because Mm -hmm. that one instance, you, you might come back to the picnic area and say, Oh, I thought we brought a bag of Doritos and I can't find them. Maybe yeah. a bear took them. So, yeah. so these little things just add up and add up and add up. And sooner or later, we're going to have Marge the Barge getting <laughs> pulled out of Lake yeah. Tahoe or the, another bear scratching someone and closing down a park road, all because of just us not using our noggin when we're in bear country. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you say this every time we do these video casts is that your knowledge can save their life. And I, I think that's what it boils down to in what you're trying to do. What we're trying to do is help educate people on be part of the solution and think about your actions. And, you know, I talk to people all the time who are so excited. They want to see a bear. They've never seen a bear um, and they really want to see a bear. And I'm so excited for them to experience that in the wild, but we have to educate them on the bear's behavior and how can you read that bear's behavior and then react in such a way that you're not training that bear to become a bad bear. (laughs) Because let's face it, what all, all of this that we're talking about is taking place over many, many weeks, months, possibly years. We're training those bears to be bad. And that's, that's what we're trying to, to get across is it's not one person who rolled their window down and tried to feed a bear and got scratched. And I don't know that's what happened. I'm just saying, right. Um, it, it's a, it's a long process. It's a training process. And we've all been guilty of doing the wrong thing. But think about it. it Cause you, you just made me realize how potentially large this, this issue is because someone could could go to the park, want to see a bear for the first time and end up leaving scraps of food. Like I said, most of the time unintentionally. Mm -hmm. And that one person listening right now is going to say, I might big one time. It's not going to hurt anything. That, (laughs) that sounds good until you realize a place like the Smokies has 14 million visitors each year. Yep. And so if you have like one person out of a hundred doing it, you're like, all right, we're 99% doing the right thing. But that one person compounded by 14 million is just repetition over and over and over for the bears. Not that one person, but for the bears, the bears are constantly getting reinforced. Mm-hmm. And so that's the hardest thing about bear education, Meg, is you you literally have to reach everyone. You have to have 100% compliance because that, mm-hmm. that whole saying, a few bad apples spoils the lot. Yeah. 
Yeah. All it takes is one or two people not being bear wise and you spoil the bear. And so this is why I love the idea of being part of the solution and not part of the problem is be proactive. Don't just do your part, but go above and beyond for the benefit of the bear. If you have a chance to make it unwelcome. In fact, I'm going to bring up my mentor, Kim Delosier, who um, he was the head biologist for Great Smoky Mountain National Park for many, many years. And the one of the phrases he coined, or at least I stole from him, <laughs> is there, there's bear country. We know where bear country is. It's throughout most of North America. But there are places that are people country. And you would define your cabin, your porch, that's people country. A bear should not be up on your porch. So anytime you see a bear approaching people country, like trying to get into a vehicle or trying to get into man-made things, that's where you should turn the head around and say, all right, I got to do something. And you you get loud, you get nasty, you yell at the bear, you scare it away. If we had, if we had, if we don't even need the majority of people doing that. If we just had a handful of people doing that in most locations, a bear is going to be too afraid to approach anything because there's a psycho woman over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, That's very <laughs> true. And, and, you know, I really appreciate the people who do stop by and ask questions about, okay, because I've had people come up to me and say, I know this is bear country. I don't know how to behave. You know, and they, they'll just ask me, what, what do we do? What's the proper protocol if you will, if we see a bear. And, you know, I so appreciate those people because I would rather you come and just say, I've never seen a bear in the wild. I don't know. I don't know how to behave. You know, I don't know how to react. And, you know, I take always take the time to teach them what you're looking for in the bear. And then also how to behave around that bear, how to, how to behave with your garbage, how to behave with the things in your backpack. You know, and there's a lot of, um, I don't want to say misinformation, but there's a lot of misunderstandings about bear behavior. You know, some people think if I go into the woods with a beef jerky stick in my backpack, the bear is probably going to chase me down and take it from me. <laughs> and, you know, and, but, and that's fine. I would rather you come in and tell me that's my fear and, and let us educate you on how to behave properly and what to do with what's in your backpack, you know? Um, exactly. And is that really a problem? You know, um, not unless you drop it on the ground, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate the the people that will just come forward and say, I, I, I don't know. And I want to know. Yeah. And that, well, those are the people that are going to help us make the difference. <laughs> well, I, I will tell you what, I've been teaching people for a long, long time, especially about wildlife. And I will tell you, Meg, I would, without a doubt, rather teach people that don't know mm -hmm. than people that think they know. <laughs> right. Because oftentimes you have to unteach them because yeah. a lot of a lot of things that they think they know, wherever they got their information from, whether or not it was handed down to them from a relative or social media or whatever, and if it's wrong it is very difficult to unteach them because mm -hmm. they, they feel they, they get defensive and, and it's under, no one likes being wrong, but I preach this all the time. Being wrong is okay. As long as you learn from being wrong. So right. nothing, there's no, no problem whatsoever being wrong. As long as you realize how to correct things. Right. I, <laughs> I always like to say there are no mistakes if you learn from your mistake. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's, I agree with you. There's, I, well, I will also add that I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of misunderstanding out, out there, but there's a lot of misinformation as well. And that's why on social media, you and I sometimes go to the same uh, hiking forums or outdoor wildlife forums, and I just can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> It's partly because, like, I, 
I don't want to speak up, but when when people provide the wrong information, right? Um, I just I feel obligated to speak up because I don't want that becoming the what everyone starts to believe. And so mm-hmm. I tried to correct that. And oh yeah, I got a lot of enemies out there that just think I'm a <laughs> know But I'm just trying to correct a lot of that misinformation that social media is just so quick to share. Well, and that kind of brings us to as another subject you and I've talked about is social media has made a huge difference, um, some good and some bad in in wildlife and, you know, in um, the way we approach wildlife, um, you know, because before you had, before you had, when you and I were little and there yeah. was the social media, you know, nobody was going out here and trying to take dangerous selfies with bison and bear and snakes, you know? Yeah. And, and so that whole aspect of social media, some of it is good if you can get good information that's accurate, but uh, some of it has been very damaging to our wildlife. And, um, you I'll know, I, and, and one thing that you and I've also talked about this is don't believe everything that people say on social media. And especially before you quote someone, check out their credentials as best you can, you know, um, for example, that you have a degree in wildlife biology. I don't, you might not yeah. want to quote me, but, um, you know, you do. And, and I would trust what you were telling me over, someone else who I don't know at all, who just put their opinion out there, but stated it as a fact, you know, and, and I think a lot of misinformation gets handed down and repeated continually that way because people don't really take the time to check out um, the sources of that information. It's just good research folks, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. check that, a little bit before you spread that. <laughs> that, that is a key part of critical thinking is knowing your sources. And, and it's, it's difficult sometimes on social media to know, to kind of figure out who your sources are. I, I obviously list my credentials, but people don't even bother looking at my, my background or education. They just call me a know-it-all. <laughs> um, but sometimes it's very difficult because with social media, you, you have people appearing to be a knowledgeable or reputable source. And there is, in fact, we're, we're going to stray a little bit from bears. It it really got under my skin a couple of days ago because there there was a um, an entity. It, it was called National Geographic, but it wasn't the National Geographic, but they went by National Geographic and they shared a photo of a baby uh, um, peacock. Peacock. As a peacock. You, you saw yeah. that. Yeah. And it was the coolest thing in the world. It was also the fakest thing in the world because yeah. it was an artificially, or the artificial intelligence where they, mm-hmm. the AI, where they create a photo of this funny, cool looking baby peacock, but it was so far from real. Yeah. And I would say because they come off as appearing to be National Geographic, mm-hmm. everyone seeing that now thinks that's what baby peacocks look like. And so mm-hmm. social media is a menace to society if, mm-hmm. it, unless and, you use it with, with your noggin. <laughs> and you, you also have to be really careful. There are some sites out there that appear to be as the national parks. You know, and they release information that looks like it could be right, um, but it, you, they're not. You know how you know how to you know how to um, figure that out because I've I've had issues with one that's called um, is called Great Smoky Mountain National Park dot com, mm-hmm. and that dot com tells you right away that is not a national park because national parks are dot gov, mm-hmm. and so they they've shared a number of of pieces of information of on wildlife that were wrong and I corrected not. And the funny thing is whenever I correct them, people tell me, you know, you're arguing with the national park. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a struggle sometimes for, for educators really wanting to 
to teach the public good things. And obviously I, I devote a good part of my life to teaching about wildlife and trying to correct this mis misinformation about wildlife and bears is it's, it's going to be a no never ending battle, but mm -hmm. with more and more people like you, Meg, and any followers out there that like spreading the, the good stuff, we need you to keep on doing that. We will. <laughs> So what else you got? Anything else you wanted to talk about regarding bears or anything for this? Um, so tell, tell us what's going on right now in the life cycle of these bears, because I know what I'm seeing, but, um, you know, we're, we're getting, we're, we're heading into the fall season. Yeah. Kind of, you know, well, um, I, I teach a class. Um, it, it's the, what was the name of it? Um, <laughs> I, I've, <laughs> I've got so many classes, but, but it literally, it, it literally goes through the, the, the year cycle of a bear. It, it's called a cub's life. And, and so we just go through all the different seasons and it's very mm -hmm. seasonal. Obviously black bears during the winter time hibernate. Mm -hmm. And when they come out of their den in say April, or so March, April, it depends latitude where you're at. So further south you, you are, the shorter their, their denning period, further north, the longer their denning period. Um, but in the springtime, they come out and they're, they're ravished. They lost 30% of their body weight. They want to start eating again because they didn't eat for many weeks or many months on end. Mm -hmm. and the problem with the early spring is there's not a lot of really nutritious foods out there. There's some grasses, but you don't have the berry crop yet. You don't have the acorn crop. And so they're eating anything they can find. Now, when you get into the, the summer, like we are, especially the late summer, right now we're in August. And so bears and lots of other wildlife are enjoying the summertime bounty of, I'm going to use a technical term, it's called soft mast, and it's the berry crop. So mm -hmm. blackberries, blueberries, things are, are ripening and blooming, and the animals are in heaven right now because they, they just have ample food supplies. Occasionally, if you have really crazy weather events, that it might, it might mess up the berry crop. But for the most part, there's, there's food to be found. But now we're getting to the point, especially when we get into September, those berries are no longer going to be available, but we're, we're hitting the, the jackpot when it comes to natural foods. And it switches from this soft food, the soft mast, to what we call hard mast, and it's the nut crop. And so bears in particular... They love acorns. They will just gorge themselves on acorns or any other kind of nut that they'll find. And they go into this feeding frenzy from like September all the way up to early November where they're feeding uh, upwards 20 hours a day. Um, but, but the one thing that's interesting, and you'll, you'll probably notice this, bears are pretty prevalent in the cove right now, Correct. Cades yes. Cove, for those listening, yeah. Cades Cove is a part of the yeah. Great Smoky Mountain National Park, that beautiful 11-mile loop that you can see bears all over the place. Yep. Um, wide open fields, or a lot of, there's a lot of open fields, yes. and so there's plenty of berries to be found, and so moms with cubs are especially visible in the summertime. When they get to this fall feeding frenzy, even though they're out and active most of the time feeding, I don't know if you'll notice, but you tend not to have the sheer numbers in the cove. Do you, do you have any idea why? In the fall? Yeah. We don't know what you're saying. Uh, yeah, you still have a lot of bears in the cove because there's still some food to be found, but you probably, the, the peak of bear activity in the cove is probably in the summertime. Right. Yeah. I, I'd say because of the food sources. Yeah, so they're, where are the where are the acorns? They're gonna be in the they're gonna be in the woods. <laughs> they're gonna be in the woods, and they'll they'll be at 
um, from the lower elevations to the higher elevations in the mountains. And so the bears are still there. They're still in the right. park, but they're they're just changing their food sources. And so unless people, if people are looking for them in the open fields in October, mm-hmm. they're just less likely to be found because they're going to be gorging themselves on a um, oak tree that just dropped a thousand acorns. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, you know, they... <laughs> They know where those trees are. They go back to those to the same ones year yeah. after year. You know, if you know where those trees are, you find them. <laughs> and the one thing that I think is fascinating, and the, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but uh, teach you how wonderful <laughs> how wonderful Mother Nature is. Um, white oaks, the white oak trees produce an acorn. Well, all oak trees produce an acorn. Um, but the the trees in the white oak family produce an acorn that the bears love because it has a low amount of tannin, which is what gives it the acidic flavor. Mm-hmm. And so the white oak, since they have low tannin, low amount of tannin, they're they're usually much sweeter. The bears will eat the white oaks first. Then when those are gone, they'll move to the red oaks. The red oaks have a little bit higher tannin content. So they're, they're just not as preferred. They'll still eat them, but they would rather have the sweeter acorn of the white oak. Here's how wonderful Mother Nature is. Um, I, I remember when I was living in Tennessee, we had a crazy uh, springtime weather event where we, it was, I think it was all the way up early May, where we had about three or four days of below freezing temperatures and all the blossoms off, all the trees were killed. And there was, there was literally panic because a large part of Tennessee, they weren't going to have a, an acorn crop because those blossoms were killed. Now, when it comes to white oaks, when those trees bloom in the springtime and they get fertilized, they produce the acorn that year. Red oaks, on the other hand, when they get fertilized, they produce an acorn, but it doesn't mature for two years. And so you have this cold spell come in, it wipes out all the acorns from the white oaks, but the red oaks already had their acorns growing on them and they weren't affected by that cold snap. Um, And so those acorns continue to grow. And although it was a lean year, you, you didn't have as many acorns, the red oak still produced enough food to carry mm-hmm. most of the animals through. And so Mother Nature kind of builds fallback plans where yeah. if something goes <laughs> anywhere here, don't worry, I got it covered over here. So That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's neat. Huh. So hopefully I taught you something today. I don't know why why it took me on that tangent, but well, you, you, asked, did you asked what bears were doing. I'm telling you what they're getting ready for. <laughs> You did teach me something, and it's something I will share and pass on. <laughs> so that's pretty neat. Anyway, the the bottom line for today is I I love talking about bears. I can do every podcast about bears, but um, bears have been in the news quite a bit lately. If it doesn't matter, east, west, north, south. Um, one of the things that was interesting, and I wanted to bring this up early in the podcast, but I forgot about it, was. Lots and lots of stories lately, Meg. They're not negative stories. We talked about a couple negative stories with um, uh, Marge the Barge and, and the, the other situation. But more and more stories are about black bears showing up in areas that they haven't been in decades. I, I was reading a story. There's a couple of different states. And they're just saying, oh, a bear was sighted in such and such township has not been seen there since like the 1950s. And so that goes to show that bear populations, especially black bear populations are doing wonderful. Um, Mm -hmm. They've done so well with protections on bears that their populations are, are bursting forth at the seams and they're repopulating areas that they used to be hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And so it's, this whole idea of bear education and being bear wise and living in bear country. um, It's, it's, there's going to be more and more of a need for it because more and more people are going to need to know how to, how to live with or coexist Mm -hmm. with black bears. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And you know, that's really interesting. I, I, um, I talked to a gentleman, I was, I had actually stopped at a gas station, um, and I had on a uniform that identified me as, uh, someone oh, who might you. know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so this gentleman stopped me and he, he said, I have a question that I'm hoping you can answer. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, um, I have a problem bear at my house. And, you know, I, he said, who do I contact? And so I, being in the state of Tennessee, I told him you need to contact TWRA. Um, and because you're not within the park. Um, and so, but you know, he t- he went on to tell me that this bear kept raiding his garden, um, you know, and he was kind of wanting to know what he could do. And I said, sir, I, I can't tell you the, the, the law. Uh, you, you need to talk to a TWRA officer, which I am not. So, um, but, you know, and it, through that conversation, he was distraught. He had a, a legit pro- problem. You know, and he offered several solutions that I did not think would probably be legal. <laughs> um, you know, and I kind of told him that. <laughs> but you know, and, and but what you're saying, what you were saying is true. We, the the bears are not just going to be confined within national parks where they're protected. They are moving out into, um, you know, some neighborhoods and communities, and even where I live, and I do live. Um, fairly close to the national park if you're driving, but if you are a bear, I'm not, I would not live that close to the national <laughs> park, but we still are seeing bear in the area where I live. I mean, it's one or two, you know, pop up every summer, somebody sees one and, and we hear about it, but you know, people don't know, people don't know what to do with the bear in their backyard. Yeah. You know, so that hey. education has to be included, I think. Well, two things. My first story, (laughs) Um, even though I haven't lived in Tennessee since 2015, I still have lots of friends and close ties to Tennessee. So I get I get pulled into Tennessee issues all the time. And this past summer, there's been bears wandering around Nashville, Spring Hill, Thompson Station, just like Mm -hmm. just outside of Nashville. And the. (laughs) We we'll call him a dingleberry because he's he's a guy I knew when I lived in Tennessee, and he swears that like me or TWRA was moving bears and releasing them into these areas, and he he, he still accuses me of that. <laughs> I, to, I try to tell him bears can wander a long, long ways, but he doesn't buy it. He still thinks that we're we have these <laughs> covert black vans that we drive through and we drop animals, <laughs> on, but that's not the case. Um, but anyway, with this with this issue of bears just expanding into more and more places, one of my good friends, Brian Peterson, he is the director of Bear Smart Durango. Durango is very much like a, oh, you've been there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> very much like a, a Gatlinburg type of town. So beautiful, beautiful part of the country in the Rockies, tons of bears around there. And he overseas or he's the director of bear smart durango and it's literally how to teach people to live with bears and i wish we had more chapters of it or more more organizations like that because what he spends his time with besides the education part which is a huge thing but he's helping people put up electric fences around their gardens he's putting electric fences around beehives um They clean up a lot of people will have fruit trees in their yard. And so he'll organize these cleanups where when the apples start falling from the fruit trees, it brings bears in and the people don't want the bears, um, especially climbing their apple trees and damaging the trees. And so Mm -hmm. they do all these proactive things to make sure bears don't become that issue that, that drives people batty. And so there, there's your calling in life. You could be bear smart Gatlinburg. Well, you know, I was just sitting here thinking that because if there was, and, and I, and in all honesty, I don't know if Gatlinburg has anything like that, but boy, if there's ever a town that should have should something. Have it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like that, it is definitely. And, and like one of the things we, we talked quite a bit earlier about like bears getting up on porches because a lot of times, even if you have all your trash, secured you you do everything right on the outside 
a neighborhood, th there's going to be smells that just drive these bears to these areas investigating. And they, um, this bear spray at Durango, one of the things they, they try to set people up with, they're called unwelcome mats. And so it's, it's literally kind of like a welcome mat up on the porch and it'll d deliver like a small electric charge to the bear. So um, it just teaches that bear. So even when no one's around to scare that bear away, the bear goes up onto a porch, steps on that, and it's he gets a zap and he he learns don't go up on that porch. Mm -hmm. Boy, if we could teach people to be as proactive as that, it, it would just save so, so many bears. Yeah. But instead we have to deal with social media of here's another picture of the bear in the hot tub. <laughs> Like, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, we're we're getting there. It <laughs> slowly but surely, but um I I think it's just a really positive thing just to hear more and more reports of bears in new areas, but it just mm -hmm. makes our job that much more daunting because we just got to reach more and more people. Mhm. Mm yeah. And and education is the key. It is. Teaching so. them. All right. Any parting shots before we go? I think this parting is good. The, the, we we got to keep bears in the limelight. So we'll dedicate a, an episode to bears and other animals. Well, especially bears. <laughs> <laughs> um, more bears often. are our favorite. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. All right. If we don't have anything, I think we're going to sign off for today. We're, we're approaching an hour, so it wasn't too bad. But folks, um, understand that if, if you've never seen a bear before, we want you to see one. We want you to enjoy it, to be as excited and as awestruck as Meg and I are whenever we do see a bear. Um, but we also want you to be very cognizant of what you're doing around that bear. So Learn as much as you can. Follow really good sources to get bear information. You can follow wildlife for you if you want because we got really good stuff. But <laughs> talk to people like Meg or other volunteers wherever they're working in national parks across the country and just learn as much as you can about these animals because what our catchphrase here at Wildlife for You is when it comes to wildlife, your knowledge often means their existence. And so... We want to we wanna spread that, spread the word about being smart around animals, and hopefully we can do our part to be part of that solution, just like Meg said. So with that, I think we're going to sign off, and I will see you in a few weeks, Meg. Absolutely, Daryl. I enjoyed it as always. All righty. We'll catch you later, folks. Good night. <laughs>